I'm Priscilla Barrera with the Investing News Network, and here with me today is Anthony C, Managing Director and CEO of Galaxy Resources. Anthony, thank you so much for joining us today. Good afternoon, Priscilla. All right, so we're here at the Catholics Conference in California. How are you finding the event so far? Uh, it's very good. I think uh, it's been a very strong turnout. Uh, I think there's been a 30 plus 40 percent growth in uh, delegates attending. And, uh, you know, good to see some familiar faces as well as some, uh, some new ones as well. All right, and we are in the last quarter of the year. What do you think has been the most challenging aspect of the lithium market? Um, I think it's very hard to pinpoint one uh, challenging aspect. I think, uh, from my perspective, uh, the demand side has continued to remain robust. Obviously, we've seen a little bit of volatility in pricing this year. Uh, but at the same time, I think... Uh, the concerns that we had at the beginning of the year um, from you know some investors and some sell sides that there was going to be a tsunami of uh, supply coming into the market has actually not realized uh, and if anything uh, there's many uh, new producers out there as well as some existing that have um, probably not delivered on targets uh, according to plan and what's your take on what's been happening with lithium prices um, so pricing, obviously, we saw quite a lot of volatility, especially in uh, in China during the course of this year. Um, so essentially, we've seen you know pricing in China go from a range of somewhere around 140, 150,000 renminbi a ton uh, down to uh, somewhere between 70, 80,000 renminbi a ton for for battery grade lithium carbonate uh, this year. Um, and so obviously that's, uh, that's uh, quite a steep decline, it's about 40% uh, decline. Um, however, on, on the other side, on the flip side, we basically have seen hydroxide remain very robust uh, in China. That's probably come from about 150 um, kind of uh, thousand you know, renminbi a ton uh, to probably slightly under that to, to now we're probably in the 120 to 130,000. So we've seen a lot more kind of um, robustness in the, in the hydroxide price uh, and the hydroxide prices that we're actually tracking uh, for the vast majority of exporters of hydroxide from China to the rest of the world, obviously predominantly uh, Japan and Korea, uh, have actually remained very strong. The last, uh, the last couple of months that I've been tracking has been in the range of somewhere between, uh, you know, outside of probably some uh, I would say kind of one uh, main uh, one exporter uh, the rest of the exporters are probably in the range of somewhere between uh, 16 to 22,000 uh, US dollars per ton uh, and one of the reasons for, for that outlier uh, who is actually outside of that range is probably some due to some historical long term contracting uh, prices that were locked in um, but on pricing I think a lot of that in my view, has been you know a result of uh, a couple of key factors, and and probably you know not so much of the uh, the uh, the supply from Australia that was expected, but didn't uh, eventuate. Uh, it's mainly driven, in in my view, through a couple of factors. Uh, one, we saw some increase of supply uh, from the brines in China, from the Qinghai region. Um, having said that, a lot of that product was actually very um, was actually low grade product. And so technical grade or industrial grade kind of carbonate that was coming out into the market uh, uh, from the brines. Uh, but as a result of, you know, I would say that there's probably, you know, two or three kind of producers in China, uh, both on the brines, but also probably uh, a couple of ones on, on the hard rock side that are not necessarily in the best uh, financial position. Uh, and as a result, we're putting product into the market at uh, kind of below what I would call fair market pricing because they needed to bring in cash flow. Um, as a result of that, they then exacerbated a situation where you had uh, low quality, low price product coming into the market on an industrial grade, but then that ended up being uh, a, a kind of drag down for the rest of the kind of battery grade kind of uh, product as well. That coupled with the fact that um, you saw a fair amount of destocking uh, through the value chain uh, this year, primarily because uh, around the first week of June of this year, China uh, kicked in the new uh, subsidy framework. Uh, and as a result of that subsidy framework, obviously any material, whether it's cathode or batteries, that were not necessarily uh, compliant or satisfying the new technical requirements of those, of those subsidies, um, basically needed to be destocked out of the system because obviously they wouldn't enjoy the same level of rebates as they were going forward. 
as a result of that destocking by the value chain, um, you had probably uh, you know uh, an abnormally kind of uh, low uh, level of uh, normal procurement and production of, of materials um, on the on the battery material side while that destocking was going on, uh, and that last but not least combined with the fact that you know the first half in China was also um, uh, is also typically softer than. Uh, the second half, which is a lot more robust, especially coming into the fourth quarter. So a combination of factors from macro individual kind of um, uh, kind of company situations. I mean, you know, credit and liquidity is, is still somewhat tight in China. There are a couple of players, uh, including all the way down to the uh, battery producers. There's one major battery producer that essentially is going through financial restructuring at the moment. Um, so, you know, combination of... Uh, Financial situations of a of a of a couple of customers and and certain kind of producers in in the market, you know, some incremental supply, low quality supply coming in or low grade supply coming in from Qinghai, uh, with the destocking and everything, kind of uh, in combination, kind of led to a downturn in pricing. But I think in the, in the past kind of a uh, couple of weeks, we've actually started to see uh, signs that uh, at least on the carbonate price, we're actually probably going to be seeing. Uh, a little bit of a, a turnaround, so the price is now bottomed out. In fact, you know some producers are now kind of starting to uptick pricing, um, and so my view is that probably between now and the end of the year, and probably through to Chinese New Year, um, I think we're going to see some recovery in the pricing. Uh, obviously, it probably won't achieve back to the levels of uh, the, uh, the the year high that we had today uh, to date. But I think um, you know we're going to see you know some recovery in the, you know, somewhere between. You know, plus or minus 10,000 RMB level, which uh, on a percentage terms is somewhere between 10 to 12, 13 percent on that battery grade carbon. In terms of stock prices, there seems that this year there was a bit of a disconnect between the optimism from experts and share prices. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think um, from the equity market's perspective, public equity uh, investors have had a hard time, uh, not just purely. For for um, you know, from the the challenges that the lithium sector is facing, obviously, there's a lot of uh, mixed signals coming from the from the lithium market. Uh, obviously, you see China prices being quite weak, but actually, rest of the world prices have been actually quite robust. Um, if we're looking at uh, SQM, which is very much a bellwether um, in terms of kind of uh, price indications, you know, they've remained fairly strong at around sixteen thousand dollars a ton. Um, our understanding of kind of hydroxide pricing, um, you know, uh, in Asia is you know anywhere between two to three thousand dollars premium to that. So while China prices have have kind of declined, rest of the world prices have actually remained quite robust, and if anything, has actually had a bit of an uptick. I think some of the challenges that investors are facing, or equity market investors are facing, is not just limited to lithium. I think overall, you're seeing a lot more volatility in the uh, in the Kind of uh, in the overall macro uh, sentiment globally, um, out, especially outside of the U.S. So obviously, you've seen a lot of volatility in the emerging markets, uh, and obviously, kind of especially in the last, I would say, um, six to eight months, the increasing tensions around kind of you know the U.S.-China kind of trade situation has also added a lot more uncertainty into the market. And I think the market currently is very much in a risk-off situation. I don't think it's isolated to how the lithium sector has performed or not, as the case may be. Uh, I think there's a lot of um, equity investors there, asset managers who have been under a lot of pressure from uh, redemptions and, and other pressures in the markets in terms of underperformance. Uh, and so as a result, you've seen an overall, I mean, outside of the U.S. equity markets, you've probably seen an overall decline across the board inequities uh, and obviously that you know naturally would also apply to to lithium as well um, and so I think uh, the disconnect that I'm also seeing uh, is that uh, I wouldn't say the optimism at the beginning of the year because it was very much a, a mixed bag you you had you know the ones who are positive and the ones who are not so positive and and the the reality is that uh, maybe the ones that were kind of positive at the outset, were probably a little bit too optimistic, but the ones that were negative at the outset were probably a little bit too pessimistic. I think the, the naysayers in the market at the beginning of the year was very much kind of um, subscribing to the view that we're going to see a tsunami of supply coming online this year. 
I think if you look at uh, whether it's the the majors uh, or the mid tiers, uh, or even the kind of new uh, junior spot or new you know oncoming incoming kind of new spodumene producers in Australia. Um, you know, everyone from SQM to some of the kind of new Australian producers have, have basically, you know, uh, where are we now? We're in October, um, have demonstrated that, uh, you know, production is kind of well behind target for where everyone was saying that they would be at the beginning of the year. Um, having said that, at least from our own kind of experience, and obviously we've just, uh, uh, in the final stages of closing a very strategic transaction uh, on Sada Vida, uh, with uh, with the POSCO Corporation. Um, one of the things that's been very interesting for us to uh, to track, uh, not only from our own experiences, but looking at other transactions, is that what I call, you know, private market or strategic uh, corporate uh, valuation metrics have been going in the opposite direction of where the public equity markets have been going. So public equity market valuation metrics seem to have been trending down. Uh, but corporate strategic transactions have been trending up, and you know we're not the only uh, beneficiary of that. Uh, you would have seen, obviously, uh, some transactions announced earlier in the year with uh, uh, with the Lithium X and, and Nextview and Tibet Summit transaction, as well as obviously most notable is the uh, TNG and SQM transaction, which was done, you know, at a at a you know sig a significant and very meaningful kind of valuation level. Uh, and so I think you're st starting to see this kind of divergence between, you know, what I would call uh, public market uh, or public equity market uh, valuation metrics starting to diverge very much with kind of private corporate slash strategic transactions. In the current state of the market that um, you just talked about, what would you say in your experience is the one mistake investors should try to avoid making if they're thinking about jumping into the sector? Um, I think investors in the past have been uh, uh, very quick to uh, dismiss um, kind of uh, you know, bullish supply, uh, bullish uh, demand scenarios, and they've been very quick to accept uh, very bullish supply scenarios. Um, and the reality of what we've seen today, uh, this year so far, is that uh, there seems. You know the the demand side of the thematic seems to be growing stronger and stronger uh, every single day, every single part of the world, uh, whether it's in the electric vehicle sector or is in the storage sector. Um, there is more and more. There are more and more developments uh, being announced, whether it's uh, investments in new capacity of batteries, of electric vehicles, uh, of cathode capacity, uh, even conversion capacity in China has been built out. Um, uh, and all of that is very positive on the, on the demand side. Um, and it's not just electric vehicles, we've seen it very much in storage. I mean, uh, last year I think the largest uh, um, energy storage system that got built out was by Tesla in South Australia with the Hornsdale project, which was a 129 megawatt hour uh, battery system. Uh, and that was the equivalent of about 2,150 Model 3s uh, in terms of total battery capacity. And yet, by June of this year, Tesla had already beaten their own, you know, record uh, with the PG&E um, battery system, which is a 1.1 gigawatt hour battery. So, energy storage, I think, is is starting to kind of gain some very interesting traction in in kind of uh, the growth profile there. And so, you know, my view is that demand has very much surprised to the upside. And as I mentioned earlier, I think you know supply has has basically disappointed. Like the planned new supply that's coming online, I think you know obviously there's a lot of issues and challenges in the Atacama for the producers there. Uh, whether it's on the brine consistency or water issues, I think recently you saw some producers also announce some restated and and downward revised kind of guidance for full year production. So you know some of those. Some of those numbers are, you know, close to, you know, 10,000 tons down from what they were guiding at the at the beginning of the year, and so in in percentage terms, that's that's quite significant. That's almost 20% down downward adjustment in guidance, and that's from an existing producer. Um, from from kind of new spodumene producer side, obviously there was a lot of hope that uh, we're going to see a significant um, kind of uh, new volume of supply that's coming online. Uh, but in Australia to date, we're in October now, and we've only really seen, based on my last estimate in terms of shipped 
uh, kind of volume of spodumene to date, new spodumene to date, 33,000 tons uh, of, um, of lithium concentrate that's been kind of shipped from Australia from, from the new producers. That's not a lot of volume. Um, obviously, we've seen some volume come from uh, uh, North America, predominantly from Canada, uh, which is uh, one of the projects that's uh, now owned by um, uh, by one of the Chinese battery makers. But again, that's been very kind of limited volume to date, you know, twenty something thousand tons. So, you know, out outside of kind of the existing producers, the new producers really, I think, have have also kind of um, you know, um, face their own challenges in terms of bringing that supply uh, online on time and in the volumes that they were originally anticipating. So, you know, from from an investor's perspective, I think uh, you know it goes back to reaffirm you know our view that uh, you know supply or new supply sometimes is really not that easy to bring online. It uh, uh, takes a lot of work and a lot of uh, discipline on the execution. And um, you know, projects, new projects take time to ramp up. And I think this year has you know shown a lot of uh, there's a lot of evidence to to kind of uh, demonstrate that point. So let's talk a little bit about uh, Galaxy Resources. You had lots of news this year. Can you let our audience know what's ahead for your Saldivida project? What's your strategy for development there? And with the current situation in Argentina, how are you seeing that developing? Sure. Um, so Sada Vida is very much our flagship development project uh, that we're going to be developing over the next uh, three years. Um, earlier this year in May, we announced a transaction with POSCO, uh, which uh, essentially we ended up signing binding uh, agreement uh, in, at, in late August um, to actually sell a small portion of our tenements in the northern portion of the Sala de Don Muerto uh, for 280 million US dollars. Um, that essentially was a transaction which resulted in us uh, selling about one and a half uh, million, I think it's 1.58 million tons of measured indicated uh, resource at the time we announced the deal um, for a consideration of 280 million US dollars, which is actually quite significant. Uh, but the interesting thing about that transaction is notwithstanding that we're selling those tenements uh, to the north of our project, um, the the reserves within the Sada Vida project are, remain untouched because they just happen to be in the southern portion uh, of our tenement holdings, which is now predominantly exclusively in Catamarca province. Um, as a result of that, you know, the project still remains a 40-year mine life project, uh, you know, slated to produce 25,000 tons a year of battery-grade lithium carbonate. Um, in May of this year, we announced an updated uh, uh, kind of capital expenditure estimate uh, to the uh, feasibility study, uh, which was for 474 uh, million US dollars. So obviously, the the consideration funds from the from the POSCO transaction will go a long way towards covering the financing for that, uh, and the remainder of the uh, financing monies that will be required to cover the capex, uh, we are at the moment uh, have an ongoing process uh, which is being advised by JP Morgan uh, essentially to bring in a, a joint venture partner, a minority joint venture partner uh, into that project which uh, essentially will fully fund the rest of that, uh, the balance of that capex uh, and so we would look to probably uh, close out the joint venture transaction by the end of this year so we you know we'll be aiming to try and announce uh, uh, that transaction uh, before the end of the year uh, with a view to completing uh, in the early part of next year and, and obviously kind of moving forward on the development of that project uh, in Argentina in Catamarca uh, over the next three years and so we're very excited I spent uh, just over a little over three weeks in Argentina last month uh, and I have to say that notwithstanding kind of how the rest of the world is viewing uh, Argentina at the moment. I think uh, you know the administration has done a very good job in terms of navigating the difficulties that are affecting all emerging markets around the world. You know whether it's uh, South America or whether it's uh, Turkey or, or other places as well. Uh, and obviously now you know they've come to an agreement with the IMF for the 50 billion dollar standby line. Obviously, you know the the country has historically gone through many cycles. So every eight to ten years in Argentina. Um, the 
tends to be this pattern of you know going through a bit of a mini kind of economic crisis. I think politically the the country is probably in a in a much kind of um, uh, stable situation from from our perspective uh, than under the previous uh, administration, uh, and so we're very much focused on kind of looking towards kind of deploying the capital that we've raised for the project and, and building the project over the next uh, three years to come into production in 2022. Uh, obviously, the government, in order to kind of um, uh, kind of try to alleviate some of the budget deficit uh, kind of financial situations, have uh, imposed an interim kind of uh, levy or an export duty on uh, on, on materials and you know other primary products such as agriculture, uh, which we understand is only going to be an interim measure for the next couple of years. So by the time the project, our project actually comes into uh, production, um, is actually not going to have uh, any impact at all uh, on on you know the financial performance of our project. Um, and so I think you know the company is very much uh, you know has a high degree of confidence that uh, it's actually a very good time to be uh, deploying capital and investing in Argentina. Um, I mean, the Argentine brands now are, you know, if you take into account all the royalty structure that we have in Argentina versus, for example, in Chile and, and other parts of the world, uh, on a kind of net-net production cost, you know, Argentina is now in lowest uh, cost quartile uh, producers of lithium uh, globally. Uh, even cheaper than Chile, given that uh, obviously with the new royalty structure that uh, Corfo put in place, it makes it a lot more expensive to produce lithium in, in that country. So I think uh, Argentina has a lot of uh, potential outside of Saudi Vida. Obviously, there are other producers in, in the country that are looking to, to, to add capacity. Um, and also, as well as other kind of potentially kind of new projects coming online as well. So I think over the next uh, three to five years, uh, Argentina will grow in its influence in terms of kind of uh, as its position as a global supplier uh, of uh, lithium resource and, and raw materials. Uh, and so I'm happy to say that, you know, off, my, off the back of my trip last month to Argentina, I had already arrived um, in the country, you know, uh, very positive and, and confident about the project going forward and about the country in general. Uh, and I left at the end of the, trip, of the trip even more positive than when I arrived. So I think if you're um, looking to invest in the country, um, you know, the level of support that we've received at the federal level and the provincial level has been outstanding um, in order to kind of help us advance the project. And, and frankly speaking, obviously, you're going to have, you know, some interim uh, challenges to overcome from uh, inflation and uh, kind of uh, foreign exchange volatility perspective. Uh, obviously, where the, you know, peso today is probably around, what, 36 to 38, um, with a view that potentially it kind of could go north of 40, probably capping out at 50. Um, if you're in the mode of deploying capital and you're holding US dollars offshore, uh, you have an ability when you're executing that project to probably get maybe slightly better favorable kind of commercial terms as you look to kind of roll out your, your capital expenditure plan as well. So I think uh, Argentina has, after this trip, has just reinforced our view that you know the governments there, whether federal or provincial, are very much open for business. They're very, very pro-business, and especially in Catamarca, very pro-mining. And uh, it's a good it's a good point in time to be deploying capital, and you know we may actually get a, a, a better net net return depending on kind of what happens in the macro situation. Great. And looking over to the other side of the world, you also hold uh, the Mount Cadling project in Western Australia. Can you talk a bit about the lithium market in Australia and what's your outlook for the sector in that region? So clearly, um, Australia is known for producing um, lithium concentrate as opposed to lithium chemicals. Uh, all of that concentrate currently goes to converter facilities or lithium conversion facilities in China. Um, now, to date, there's only kind of three main producers to date. Uh, Greenbush is Mount Catlin, which is our project, and also Mount Marion. Uh, Greenbush is being owned by Talison, uh, and uh, Mount Marion being owned by um, uh, kind of uh, mineral resources near Meadows and, and Ganfeng. Um, we have seen, you know, some uh, new joiners uh, to the producer lineup. Uh, 
uh, in Australia, and you know they've uh, managed to get their first shipments out recently. So big congratulations to them. Uh, I think uh, there's going to be a period of time when you know projects take the better part of nine to twelve months to actually ramp up. Uh, and at the same time, obviously, you see some of those, uh, some of that supply going into China, um, and, and the majority of the, kind of the downstream customers are are, are fairly uh, stable. But there's obviously, again, coming back to my point earlier, that there's during this period of time, I think there's going to be some um, volatility, especially in the financial position of some of those uh, uh, downstream players. So. You know, it remains to be seen uh, how smoothly the concentrate that's coming out of Australia uh, will be able to find itself into the lithium chemicals market uh, in uh, in China, because it requires not only for the spodumene to be coming out of Australia, but it has to be of the right volume, of the right grade, and importantly, of the right impurity profile. So, as much as as important as it is to focus on the lithium grade uh, in that concentrate, it's also very uh, it shouldn't be forgotten. It's actually the impurities that actually make or break the product, and uh, and then the second part of the equation is whether the conversion facilities who are taking that product in China have have been uh, completed. Whether those conversion facilities are, are commissioning, whether they're ramping up, uh, and whether or not they're able to produce product to a certain specification as well. So there's a number of hurdles that actually have to be overcome in both Australia and uh, China in order to really see that uh, you know, new, as a new, new supply of concentrate be able to come out into the lithium chemical market. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier to date, I think you know, we've seen a very kind of limited volume of new supply of concentrate that will come out of uh, Australia from the new producers. No doubt that will be growing uh, over time. Uh, but again, this reinforces the point that I was trying to make earlier that I think the uh, uh, the ability for supply side to respond is sometimes overestimated uh, and it will just take time for both the mines in Australia, the new mines in Australia, as well as the new conversion facilities that are taking that new product to actually ramp up and be able to perform uh, according to planned volume and, and planned, uh, planned quality. Right, and my last question for you today, Anthony. Looking ahead, any other company milestones that investors should keep an eye out for next year? So, obviously, you know, by the end of this year, we expect to be closing out, um, you know, the the second step of our strategic financing for Saudi Vida. Um, so, we'll obviously be looking to um, complete that transaction uh, between now and. Uh, will announce it by the end of this year and, and complete early next year and obviously that would then allow us to start moving ahead on the development of the Saudi Vida project so that's uh, important. The other thing that we are also starting to evaluate uh, certain opportunities is you know forming a view to establishing our own downstream strategy uh, off the back of our producing mine uh, from Mount Catlin in Australia. Uh, and so we're evaluating different options as to how we want to pursue that downstream strategy to actually add a conversion uh, leg uh, to that to that side of the business. And then, last but not least, obviously we have um, we're going to be submitting uh, shortly, uh, you know, the the relevant uh, uh, ESIA applications for uh, for the James Ray project, which will then kind of start to. Uh, kick off uh, the uh, the permitting process for our project in uh, in Canada in Quebec, uh, but importantly, we'll be also be undertaking uh, during the course of next year uh, a fully kind of uh, integrated upstream and downstream solution uh, feasibility study uh, for that James Bay project as well. So we have a few strategic initiatives that will be ongoing uh, outside of uh, outside of South of Eden next year as well, which obviously will be. Uh, starting to move into execution phase for the project. Right. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Priscilla.